My name is Harrison Wheeler, and this is Technically Speaking. Welcome to the second day of Technically Speaking during SF Design Week, aka San Francisco Design Week. I am your host of the Technically Speaking podcast, Harrison Wheeler. Uh, and today I have Maurice Cherry as a guest. Super excited to have you on board. Uh, and in a little bit of, I, I've got like a really interesting story about this. So like today is one of those things that, in my opinion, kind of manifests itself probably five years ago. Um, so the first ever podcast that I was ever featured on was Revision Path. Um, and I remember just kind of, we were chopping it up after the show. And I think it was actually around this time, around May, June-ish. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were actually talking about, hey, man, it'd be amazing if like we could do something in San Francisco at the time. I had just moved out to San Francisco. Um, and, you know, when I took, you know, took my shot in terms of getting this podcast during SF Design Week, you were definitely the first uh, on my list to be on the show. And, and I'm so grateful for you to be here. Well, thank you for thinking of me. Thank you for having me. This is I think this is going to be a fun conversation. Thanks, man. And, and, and you know, just to kind of give everyone uh, a bit of a lay of the land here, if this is your first day joining, we had our first broadcast yesterday uh, with Alyssa Hart, as well as Mercy Bell during the Take Care. We had a great conversation around mental health. Every single day of the week, I'll be having different guests at 11.30 p.m. or 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So tomorrow at the same time, I'll have guests on through the rest of the week. And it's going to be a great time. Um, and, and just to kind of move into the show, Maurice, why don't you give folks just a, a brief introduction about yourself uh, before we head into the, the questions? My name is Maurice Cherry. Like Harrison said, I have a podcast called Revision Path, uh, where I interview Black designers, developers, and digital creatives from all over the world. I've been doing that now since 2013, so we're a little over eight years old. Uh, Revision Path is also the first podcast to be included in the Smithsonian's archives for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, about myself, uh, my background is mostly in the STEM fields. I have a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Morehouse College. I have a graduate degree in telecommunications management from Keller Graduate School. Um, I've also had my own design studio I did from 2008 to 2017 called Lunch. And currently, as of this recording, I am fun employed. Hey. Uh, I'm between gigs right now, but I start uh, near the end of this month at Nava as a content strategist. I'll be really looking forward to that. Uh, what is something that you're really looking forward to now that you have some, some time off to kind of decompress and evaluate things? Oh, man, I am looking forward to doing nothing. <laughs> uh, I do. A, I mean, just in terms of work and the podcast, I do a lot of stuff. I'm looking forward this week to really doing nothing. I even already went ahead and got the next few episodes of the show produced so I could have yeah. ample time to do absolutely nothing. I'll probably catch up on some PlayStation games. Yeah. There's some games that I bought, like I bought Fuser a while ago. Yeah. I still have Persona 5 Royal that I haven't even like scratched the surface of. Um, have lunch with friends. I had lunch with a friend earlier today, Taco Tuesday. So nice. we had lunch and, and drinks. So that was fun. I get to catch up with people now that folks are vaccinated, yeah. uh, you know, going out and stuff. That's pretty much it. Like, yeah. I'm just going to relax these next two weeks. I don't have any sort of a, yeah. a real game plan in mind. That, that's good. That's the way to do it. Like, in terms of, like, your, <laughs> your PlayStation games, what kind of genre are you into? So I'm an I'm a RPG yeah. action adventure, I guess you could say puzzle yeah. game person. Like, I have – and it's funny because I really don't even play my, my PS4 that much. Yeah. Uh, so mostly I have role playing games. Like I, I of course have the, the Persona series. Uh, started off with that on PlayStation Two yeah. with Persona Three, and then moved my way up to Four and Five. Um, I mostly play my Switch a lot. Okay. I play my Switch a ton more than my PS4, and I don't know if that's just because it's more portable. But sure. even with that, it's like I'm playing old school fighting games like King of Fighters or Street Fighter. Yeah. Uh, I, I might be playing some puzzle games. I'm a I'm a big fan 
of Picross. Oh yeah. Which is like this, this Japanese um, sort of like puzzle crossword yeah. kind of game. Uh, yeah. That's kind of where I'm, I'm at right now. It's funny. Cause like I, I don't really consider myself that much of a gamer, but yeah. I will always, for some reason, have the latest gaming system. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to have the option. Yeah, yeah. So, like, even now with the Switch, like, I know, I think, like, there might be a new version of the Switch coming out sometime soon. Yeah. I haven't even thought about getting a PS5 because I know it's not going to fit in my, like, entertainment hutch. Yeah. So I was like, uh, it's okay. Yeah. I was like, I, I don't play my PS4 enough sure. to warrant getting a PS5 yet. Yeah. In the, I feel like I will in the future, though. Yeah. I, I need to see some more games come out. I just, yeah, I just got the, the, the new Xbox, and um, I switched from playing the, the one before that. And the, the, graphic, uh, the graphic changes are very, very minimal, minimal right? So mm-hmm. it really hasn't been too much of a justification outside of a minor, uh, you know, bump in performance, right? Because you can play the games right away. There's some a little bit more detail, but all in all, nothing has changed too much. So I'm not really yeah. one. To, I'm not really one to rush and get new consoles, but uh, fairly fairly disappointed considering I'm still playing the same games that were on the previous console. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, it's it's definitely about the games. It has yeah. to be a kind of game that I know I can really like sink into, yeah. like the Persona games, for example. That's not a game you can just pick up and play in sure. five minutes. Like you you're dedicating at least 30 minutes to an hour yeah. every time you play that game. Yeah. On the flip side, like if I play Picross, that's something that honestly I do like near the end of the day to wind down because it's a game that you can kind of like detach from. You can just sort of focus on the puzzle and work that. Like I'll play that while listening to music or yeah. play that while listening to podcasts or something and just like mellow out. It's a very nerdy activity yeah. to like, be playing a puzzle game to relax, but um, yeah, <laughs> but that's normally what I'll do at the end of the day. Yeah. All good. So, so you mentioned podcasts, right? You produce your own. What are some other podcasts that you listen to uh, outside of, outside of your own? Do you even listen to your own after you produce it? Like how, how is I that? I don't. Yeah. I don't. I, so that's funny. I don't listen to my own podcast after I finish it. Cause I, I was there. Yeah. So I don't necessarily need sure. to go yeah. <laughs> yeah. and listen to it. Um, and I often will recall, if someone mentions a show, I'll remember kind of what went on throughout the show sure. pretty much. Um, other shows I'm listening to, I actually have my phone right here, I can tell you. So I'm listening to the NPR Politics podcast, which I just kind of listened to that to get sure. the lay of the land in terms of news. Uh, the Atlantic has this podcast about the coronavirus called Social Distance that I'll listen to. Um, I listen to Keep It from Cricket Media, Code Switch from NPR. Uh, Jill Scott has a podcast. Oh, nice! Called J. Ill the podcast. Okay, and it's an interesting show because I mean it's it's her and two of her friends. It's all from like a black woman's like perspective and point of view, which I don't get to hear that often. Yeah, so it's good for me to listen to it because it reminds me of like hearing my mom talk with my grandma or talk with her sister right. or something like that. Um, I listen to Twenty Thousand Hertz, which is a show around sound design. Um, and I also listen to this podcast called, <laughs> it's called True Story. Okay. Like T-R-U-U-S-T-O-W-R-A-Y. <laughs> and I started listening to this out of the blue because they were covering, oh my God, they were covering, I'm trying to remember. Oh, they were covering the first season, I think, of The Real World. Oh. So it's two guys that hosted Dave Holmes and Mike Dowdy. And they sort of do this like retrospective of old episodes. <laughs> so they did. I remember them doing like the first season of the real world. Uh, they also did the reunion show that happened like this spring on Paramount plus yeah. with the, the real world homecoming, I think was what it was called. Um, and now they're trying to decide which season they want to do next. Like, do they want to do season two, sure. which was in LA? Do they want to do season four? No, season three, which is in California. No, San Francisco. Well, it was in California. Yeah. Season three was in San Francisco. Season four, which was in London, or season seven, which is in uh, Seattle. Okay. So they do, they're they going by what's available on Paramount because sure. Paramount doesn't have a lot of the earlier, older seasons. So they're trying to figure out which one they want to do next. But yeah. those are the shows I'm listening to right now. I kind of rotate a lot of shows in and out, but yeah. those are my kind of like stable ones week after week. Yeah, that's a pretty pretty wide variety 
that you have there. Yeah, it's like some pop culture stuff. Yeah. It's some news stuff. Oh, there's one from HBR called the HBR ID cast. That's yeah. from uh, Harvard Business Review. So that's kind of about like business and work and stuff like that. So yeah. I have a pretty like eclectic mix, but I swap shows in and out. Like I'll listen to a lot of single episodes of podcasts, sure. but won't necessarily subscribe. So I'm right. like in and out listen to a lot of shows it's like the that's like the true spotify approach <laughs> to podcasts right <laughs> um so speaking of uh like the jill scott uh so you're in atlanta right now mm -hmm. um and i really have to ask you you know atlanta has a huge history of r&b and rap artists um yeah who are your favorites i mean I wouldn't be a true ATL and I'm not from Atlanta just to yeah. be clear for people listening, but I wouldn't be a true ATL and if I didn't mention outcast, like yeah. they will still forever and always be my favorite. Um, I also really like Janelle Monet. I, I first met Janelle Monet when I was in college. Mm. Uh, this was back in the early two thousands and I got her, I bought her, I remember buying her first CD, yeah. not, not the, um, God, what was her first CD? Not the one where she was the Android, but like the one before that, I think it was called the audition or something like that. Like I remember buying her very first CD for $5 yeah. on the strip at Clark Atlanta when I was in college. Wow. And I knew some of the people that she hung around with in her crew. I know some of the folks that are in her crew now with Wonderland and stuff. Yeah. So I've, I've kind of like been able to track how she's grown from selling CDs all the way up to kind of where she is now. Right. Uh, those probably are like right now are my favorites. I mean, I think, you know, Atlanta is such a, a big entertainment city in general. Yeah. Like there's a lot of music that flows in and out of here. I would say that Atlanta probably has such a good underground R and B scene that a lot of people mm. may not be familiar with. Cause there's different venues, like there's uh city winery or Churchill grounds or other places where people are performing a lot of like somewhat hole in the wall type clubs. Yeah. But Atlanta has like a really like rich R and B and soul history. Like people think probably just hip hop when they think of Atlanta. Sure. But there's like a, a strong hip hop scene here. There's a strong rock scene here. Mm. There's a strong jazz scene here. Like there's a lot of music just depending on what it is that you like. Um, but I can't think of any like contemporary folks though because I I'm I'm old man. I listen to a lot of <laughs> <laughs> I listen to a lot of like old like brown liquor music. You know, so I'm I'm listening to like the spinners and stuff like that. So it, it varies. It depends yeah. on kind of what my mood is, but I'll, I'll always and forever come back to outcast for something. I'll just find myself yeah. thinking of a line or, or something like that. And it just, you know, pops into my head or something. What, 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 what's, what's one of your favorite songs? Oh man. Or is there not oh, one? Well, I, like, I feel like this is like one of those top, what's, what's the top five hip hop artists of all time. <laughs> no, so it's probably either Crumbling Herb from Southern Playlist of Cadillac Music, or hmm, you know, I would say the entire AT Aliens album yeah. from start to finish. Yeah, because it's easy to sort of pick songs out of that one. That was sure. the one where they had the comic book cover. Yeah, and they really kind of leaned into this more like sci-fi, Afrofuturistic yeah. kind of bit. Um. That whole album is an experience from beginning to end. Like, I almost tell people, like, you have to listen to it with no skips. You have to go all the way through yeah. to kind of, like, get the through line of it. But, yeah, that whole album for sure. Um, and the thing with Outkast and, and the whole kind of organized noise family is they begat so many great artists. We talked right. about Janelle Monet, but, I mean, like, Goody Mob, yeah. Sleepy Brown, Joy, well, Joy didn't really come out of organized noise, but like there's a, a ton of artists that have come out of there. So like that whole sound right. is like prolific in Atlanta right. through a lot of other other artists. Right. So so speaking of prolific, you are a living legend. OK, <laughs> so so and the reason I say that, for one, you've you've hit over 400 episodes on the Revision Path podcast, which is an amazing feat. Uh, additionally, you are minted into African American history by being in the Smithsonian, and so oh, <laughs> if if some if there was like a biopic made for Maurice Cherry, who would be the actor? 
who would be the actor? I think who and you who can't say you can't you can't be like you know you can't be like Michael B. Jordan, right? Like no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not be realistic. <laughs> um, probably like a younger Forrest Whitaker, probably. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Or like a younger Charles S. Dutton. Okay. Or yeah. Yeah, like someone like that, probably. Yeah. Has yeah. Has anyone ever asked you this question before? Mm -mm, oh no. wow! I mean, you got you had it like right <laughs> off the top of the dome. I'm in, I'm impressed. I, 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 I had to think about it a little bit. Like, who would it, who would I have? Because I'm thinking of like actors like right around my. Age. Actually, you know what? If I'm thinking of actors right around my age, yeah, probably Brian Tyree Henry because we both went to Morehouse together okay. at the same time. Yeah. So probably him. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can think about it some more. You can we we got the email. You can you can <laughs> type it up, shoot it to me, and I will I'll tweet it later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so so look, I want to I want to kind of move back into whole the whole revision path uh, podcast. What exactly is the definition of a revision path, right? Uh, and and why did you start it? So the name Revision Path itself, like I wanted to go with a name, honestly, that either, well, for two reasons, I wanted to go with the name Revision Path. I wanted something that could sort of go with either design or development, because those were kind of the two yeah. particular kind of uh, paths that I was looking at at the time. Sure. So like you think of a path in Illustrator, for example, mm -hmm. and then of course you always have design revisions, but then also you think of a revision path for like, code or like the path to a directory on a server or something right. like that so i wanted something that was going to kind of be ambiguous in that way first of all sure. secondly i picked that name and i sort of retconned this whole meaning of the revision path being sort of going off the beaten path like mm. the fact that i'm talking to so many black designers and such that may not have been profiled sure. in other design media sure. this is sort of a revision to that mm. but prior to revision path i started uh, an event called the Black Weblog Awards. And that was something that started in 2004. We did our first installment in 2005. Did that every year up until basically around 2010, 2011, where I sold it. And I just know from that project, the biggest issue that I had with really getting wider support for it, yeah. and I hate to say it, but the biggest reason is that it had Black in the name. Mm. And so a lot of people, because this was also around the time that Obama was running first for president, and there was all this stuff around things being post-racial, post-racial. So if I'm coming up saying I have the Black Weblog Awards, the, re <laughs> the response I would get is, but we're post-racial. Why do you need, why does it have to be a Black Weblog Awards? Why can't it just be the Weblog Awards? And I'm like, because those already exist yeah. and we're not there. So that's why I'm doing this. But I also just wanted to have something, honestly, that people wouldn't completely write off right. just because the name Black was in it. Like I wanted people to see the name Revision Path, see what it's about, and then have it click mm. instead of them sort of writing it off just just from the name. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and what was the, what was the second part of your question? Yeah. So so why? Like, why did you start it? Why? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to start it because I knew that there were other black designers and such out there, like peers of mine, contemporaries, et cetera, that were doing really great work that were just not getting right. any sort of recognition. I mean, the web back then, and this is pre-Twitter, pre-social media, you know, there was not really a lot of ways for your work to be seen unless it was through a larger entity like uh, a design organization or a design company or a magazine or something like that. Right. And so because that sort of avenue to get these stories out there didn't really exist in a way that people could latch on to it, right. um, a lot of people's work just kind of went by the wayside, you know. Right. Um, it's been so interesting now to talk to people who were designing back then and then be able to bring them now to the present and share the work that they've done during that time when nobody may have really paid attention to it. And when I say nobody, I don't mean they were sort of languishing in obscurity. I mean that the general design community did not know that this person was doing this caliber of work or this level of work. And yeah. we're talking CDs, websites, logos, etc. For example, episode 400 with Brent Rollins. I mean, Brent Rollins did the logo for Mo Better Blues. Mm. He did the logo for Poetic Justice. He did the logo for Boys in the Hood. 
Would would we have really known that unless, and I'm not saying through my interview specifically, sure. but during the time that he was making all this prolific stuff, the design industry was not, you know, he, was, he wasn't getting an AIGA medal. Right. He right. wasn't being featured in, you know, Design Eye or, you know, Step Magazine or anything like that. Mm. So just getting a chance to kind of bring these people into the, the limelight and let them have a chance to show off their work was a big reason why I wanted to do Revision Path, to give them an opportunity to say, this is who I am, this is what I do, yeah. and this is why it matters to me, because that perspective really had not been shared widely uh, prior to that. Yeah, and I, and I think that's what's really fascinating even about that story is just like the intersection of just like cultural icons. These aren't just like random movies. Like these are cultural, iconic movies where design has also been adjacent. If you haven't even seen the movie, you've probably at least seen the title uh, mm -hmm. of them, right? Uh, even, I think even all those rap albums, like, you know, you mentioned kind of AT Aliens. Like, that is, that, like, when you see that album, you know exactly what it's about. Um, and, and that was done by a black designer. That was done by D.L. Warfield. Yeah, exactly. So um, I guess kind of on on that note, in, in terms of you reaching 400 are interviewing more than 400 design practitioners around the world. What are some of the, some of the standout uh, guests that you've had on the show? Oh, wow. Uh, I have to say Brent, um, not just because he was episode 400 and that was recent, but because a lot of Brent's work has influenced a lot of my work mm. as a designer. Um, just the way that he depicted a lot of things around hip hop culture in yeah. this sort of, retro futuristic sort of way with uh you know big swashy fonts and and sort of like a 60s that's 60s but like a 70s 80s sort of aesthetic i mean mm. i would see that in magazines i would see that on television um and he was sort of the progenitor of all of that like that came mm. from him uh, so him specifically i would i would rate as one um most recently and this episode will come out in a few weeks sure. um but I interviewed um, a shoe designer, a footwear designer that worked at Nike for 15 years. He's worked at Allbirds. He designed mm. a couple of Yeezys. Wow. Um, and like getting a chance to talk with him about footwear design. And like now he has his own studio and makes his own shoes, you know, and like talking about why shoes are such an important thing. Like, of course, people like sneaker culture and stuff like that. But yeah. you get into the intrinsic reason of like, why do people wear certain types of shoes, even people that claim not to be fashionable right. have an opinion about shoes. You know, you're not going to just wear like clown shoes. You right. want to wear something kind of decent. Um, who else? My goodness. Uh, Sarah Honey Young, I always have to mention. She's the homie. Uh, I've had her on the show three times okay. now. And every time I've had her on the show, she's someone who I've known from way, way back, like year 2000 at least. Yeah. And to see her evolution as a creative mm moving from New York city to Pittsburgh, shifting her focus more into like DJing and photography and like just seeing her evolution over the years has been something that's been great to document yeah. on the show. Um, God, who else? I mean, I think anybody that I interview internationally is always interesting just to see how design is, is sort of portrayed through their eyes sure. and through their particular community. Um, I, I'm trying to think the last international interview I had was, Actually, it comes out in a few weeks. I'm talking about future interviews, but yeah. I interviewed a Trinidadian designer who is currently in Switzerland, in Zurich, huh. uh, getting her degree in design. And so to talk about her shift from like Trini culture to Swiss culture and how that is influenced in her design and how does mm. she bring some of the islands into this like, you know, Nordic environment, right. you know. Um, I mean, that kind of like juxtaposition of things like that, I find just super interesting. Yeah. How folks, how folks are bringing their culture into their design wherever they are. Right. It, it just also kind of shows how much evolution is still continuous in, in sort mm -hmm. of like design and what it means and what the output of it looks like. Um, you know, I, I've, I've always loved having these conversations with, with folks on the show because I know that. I, I learn a little bit of uh, not only about that person, but just in general. And so what are some learnings that you've had? What are some big themes that you've really kind of seen, you know, throughout the tenure of your show? 
Ooh, I think the the biggest thing that I've learned is that, you know, there still needs to be more like apprenticeship, mm. I think, for black designers. Um, that's different from sponsorship. That's different from an internship. But like actually having a space to allow someone to maybe shadow someone or work under someone uh, as an apprentice to give them the space to fail and to mm. mess up. One thing I've, I've seen, I think, not just from designers on the show, but even from my own personal experience is that Black designers often are tasked to kind of have to get it right the first time. Right. There's very little, if any, room for error. If you're the only Black designer on your team and you do something and it doesn't go well, right. no one's going to say, oh, well, we'll just you know kind of fix this up later or something like that. That gets put on you and every other Black designer yeah. <laughs> that may come across that company like now you have to represent the race right and like that's a that's a big burden to have especially if you're just starting out at a place or you're just starting out in your career and so i think apprenticeship is important because it allows you kind of a safe space to learn and to work under someone without making a mistake that could potentially end your your job or end your career you know um, so I think that's something that I would love to see more of, particularly from studios. Sure. Like I know that there are a lot of black owned studios. We've had several on the show, but offering some level of apprenticeship to new designers to kind of get their feet wet, learn the business in like uh, a safe and kind of nurturing environment that still pushes and challenges them. Mind you, we're not necessarily baby birding them information, sure. but, but you know, giving them the opportunity to do this in a space that's not so sort of cutthroat or hostile Mm. i mean i think for anyone particularly for for black i'd say for black people in general like the corporate world is something we really have to learn yeah like we have to learn how to assimilate into that how to become a part of that how to speak the language how to dress how to do this how to do that whatever because it's not really made with us in mind we have to sort of conform to that right and so apprenticeships hopefully take some of the stress off of that and still allow you to kind of do your best work or at least ramp up to doing your best work in an environment that allows you to do that without the slightest transgression, you know, costing you your gig. Right. Right. I'm I'm curious. Is that something that you've kind of seen? Is that thematic? Is that is, I guess, is the work environment piece. Is that something that's been thematic throughout a number of guests? Is that more of a personal thing? Maybe kind of take us through that. It's it's kind of been I, I mean certainly for entrepreneurs and for studio owners sure I've seen that um, like the, the, there's someone who I just interviewed recently the footwear designer I mentioned and like his studio is largely uh, an apprenticeship sort of collective mm. like he knows people that can do certain things but he also has a lot of young creatives that he works to nurture in a space where they realize that this this work can be fun right. And they can bring their culture into it, and it's not a bad thing. Right. Whereas if they were maybe at a more traditional agency structure, that might be frowned upon. Yeah. Um, I, I also think, uh, I mean, I've seen it, yeah, mostly around entrepreneurs and studio owners. Not so much, I think, around folks that are already in-house. Sure. But I think just based on what their individual stories have been and how they've sort of come into uh their particular roles, mentorship is also an important part of that. Right. So uh, it's a it's a different level of support at that age. It's not necessarily about shadowing someone, but having someone that may have walked the road that you have walked mm. and can sort of give you information on like, these are some pitfalls or yeah. these are some things you may need to know, or here's how you can handle this situation that you may not know about, but I've been through. So they're helping out sort of like in, in different sorts of ways. You were born and raised in Selma, Alabama, which mm-hmm. uh, is, is, has, a, has a pretty prolific history in terms of uh, American history. Uh, and I don't think it's necessarily too positive in terms of the, the, you know, the situation surrounding it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely more known for that than design. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so... <laughs> Um, maybe kind of take us through sort of like with that journey uh, to get into design, right? Because I'm, I'm, I would assume you've had to do a lot of discovery yourself to sort of figure mm-hmm. out what that is. And so maybe kind of take us through that. And I, I'd also maybe would love to hear your advice for designers that are trying to navigate their way into an industry where there aren't 
people that might look like them or someone that has the expertise to, let's say, mentor them along that road? Yeah. So, yeah, with Selma, I mean, it's a it's a small southern town in south central Alabama. Uh, it's 50 miles west of Montgomery. It's the, the county seat of Dallas County. Uh, and yeah, it's not a it's not a design town at all. People mostly know it for the Edmund Pettus Bridge and Bloody Sunday. I mean, my discovery of design while I lived in Selma was largely through a couple of different sources. One was through my older brother, who is a, a very great artist. He paints, he sketches, he sculpts, he does a, he has like mm. amazing, phenomenal, God given artistic talent. So a lot of that came from just watching him be able to do his thing. Um, also, I mean, we got a lot of magazines back home because we didn't, we didn't have, I don't remember us getting cable until, I don't know. I might've been, I might've been a teenager, like yeah. in high school when we got cable for the first time and stuff. So like a lot of the, uh, I did just a lot of reading. And so a lot of that came through magazines. We had yeah. subscriptions to like the source yep. vibe, but we also were getting things like Sports Illustrated. Yeah. We were getting um, Consumer Reports used to put out this magazine called Zillions, mm. which was like a Consumer Reports for kids. Um, and so there were a lot of magazines that I would read to just sort of learn about a life and a culture outside of outside of Selma, Alabama. And then also this was sort of I mean, from 95 on, it's kind of the advent of the, the personal computer and internet. Right. And so I could go to the library or I could go to my school's computer lab or I could go to my mom's job, had a computer lab also. She was at a school uh, and I could spend hours in the lab just like surfing the web. And I mean, this is the early pre 2000s web, mm. which is <laughs> it's very much the wild, wild west. I mean, you were you really were left to your own devices for a lot of things. And so I taught myself a lot about html right. and sort of just really just figuring stuff out like i think for me having that level of curiosity is what got me interested in really what design could be because at that time i had heard about a graphic designer and had even started doing some graphic design while i was in high school like i designed our school newspaper right. so i had opportunities to kind of get hands on with things you know with stuff like that but it wasn't at the time something that i really looked at as a profession. I was always just kind of doing it as a hobby on the side. Even when I went off to college and I told my professor at the time, my advisor actually, that I wanted to be a web designer, he told me that the internet was just a fad and that nobody is, is going to be interested in this. Like if you want to make web pages, what's a web page? Nobody's going to be interested in that. Right. And told me that if that's what I really wanted to focus on, that I should just change my major, which I ended up doing. Uh, but I still kind of just did stuff on the side. I designed my scholarships, uh, like web page when I was in college. I did a, a few sort of like logos and things like that, really just sort of teaching myself, like yeah. going to Barnes and Noble, getting one of those Photoshop's tips and tricks books, opening it up, copying stuff down, taking it back home to use on my cracked version of Photoshop that I downloaded <laughs> off of LimeWire or Kazaa. <laughs> hoping it didn't give my computer a virus and trying to like teach myself how to do yeah. this because there were, there weren't, unless you went to like an art Institute or something like that, right. there weren't really any schools that showed you how to do this. And I mean, I was at, a, I, mean, I was at a really good school. I was at Morehouse on scholarship. I wasn't going to just leave that to just go to art school right. and learn this stuff. So I was really kind of teaching myself. Sure. Um, the second part of your question around like, how can, uh, people sort of break into this field. I mean, for me, the way that I've done it has been through creating my own projects. Mm. That's been the way that's helped for me is to sort of take the knowledge that I've learned and create something myself and then let that be the thing that gets people noticing the work that I'm doing. Right. So, for example, the first big project like that was the Black Weblog Awards. I mean, I started doing that. All of a sudden, we're hearing from NPR. We're hearing mm. from... Oh uh, God, some celebrities that contacted me in those early days. We heard from uh, Questlove at one point. Wow. We heard from RuPaul. We heard from Tyra Banks, like in those early, early days from Kanye. Yeah. So like. Wait, Kanye, Kanye to, wanted to be on it? <laughs> Kanye had won Best Celebrity Blog. 
Ah, yeah. One year, I forget which year it was, yeah. but like someone from his camp did reach out. I was like, wow. wow. <laughs> Kanye had a really so, like popular blog back in the early 2000s, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he. Did, I think he was blogging back then, yeah. probably. Yeah. But for me, it's been like doing these sorts of projects that allow others to see the breadth of my work. Yeah. Um, and I think you start, I think you're starting to see a similar thing happen sure. now, sure. particularly through like what YouTubers do, mm -hmm. what TikTokers do, et cetera. They're basically creating their own programming and things that they want to see right. because there's, they may not have a job that's going to let them express themselves that way. So they have to kind of make their own thing that shows this is what I'm capable of. Right. This is like from my imagination. This is what I'm able to do with the skills that I have. And so doing projects like that have always helped me to sort of get other people to notice. I would recommend that for anyone. If there's yeah. an idea that you really want to pursue, instead of looking for a job that's going to allow you to do it, find a way to make your own project out of it, mm. no matter how big or small that is, and just execute on it. It doesn't have to be perfect. You, I mean, there should be like a gradual upgrade path to get to where you want to go, but make your own project, get started on it, tell other people about it and just keep at it. You know, yeah. that's, that's what's really helped for me. Yeah. And, and I mean, maybe, maybe RuPaul or uh quest level reach out. You just never know. Um, but yeah. it's important to just get something <laughs> out into the world. Uh, you know, that it Hopefully they don't reach out with a cease and desist. Now that did happen <laughs> with Microsoft. The second year that we did the black weblog awards, yeah. uh, I, I could, I could tell this story. The designer that we had used had like completely, ripped off one of their campaigns Oh no! and Microsoft had reached out and I was like, Oh, Microsoft reached out. And it was from their lawyer cease and desist using this design. I was like, damn, <laughs> how could you mess me up like that? And at this point the awards were over. So it yeah. was easy to kind of like phase it out, but sure. you know, don't get, don't get attention for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Wise, wise, <laughs> wise advice. Um, and I appreciate that story and that advice because it's very, very rich in, in history too as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think one of the things that, that kind of comes to mind for me is, uh, you know, when we talk about the future episodes. So Maurice and I actually have an episode that we've already recorded and it goes pretty deep into that. Um, so definitely look out for that in the coming months. Um, but in our last conversation, uh, we touched on this a little bit, um, and it was about the work that you did on Revision Path, the work that you've done on the presentation around where the black designers, um, mm -hmm. I really want to kind of maybe focus on like passing the torch and what that means okay. to you and, and maybe kind of describe how you maybe picked up the mantle as well. Um, because I know that Shell Miller also had some influence and you all have, have had uh, a relationship there. Maybe kind of take us through that and, and maybe what the future might look like, or maybe some of the things, uh, that you foresee being excellent opportunities for aspiring and established designers, uh, black designers moving forward. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting how, how that happened with, with Cheryl. So to give some backstory, uh, in 2015 at South by Southwest Interactive, I gave a presentation there called Where Are the Black Designers? I started putting that presentation together in 2014, uh, partially because I was part of AIGA's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, and that gave me some access to some AIGA archives for things that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to put a presentation together really kind of as a distillation of all of the questions that I kept getting from companies and other excuse me, and other people that would come to Revision Path, like they would listen to the episodes, but then they would also get on Twitter and be like, well, where are the black designers? Or mm -hmm. we're trying to find black designers and we don't know where they are, you know? And I'm like, well, let me just do a presentation to kind of hopefully not squash the question, yeah. but at least give you some like insight into it. And as I really started doing my research, that was how I discovered Cheryl. Now, when I had first reached out to Cheryl, she was retired pretty much like she had done all the work that she had done in her past as a designer she was a theologian and i had like discovered she had a book on amazon like a kind of an autobiography on amazon and she was like content living her life and i sort of reached out to her like hey i'm maurice i'm doing this presentation and i'd love to talk to you and like 
learn more about your work and everything. And that sort of started mm. the the conversation, which then started the relationship between Cheryl and I that sort of continued on to this day as it relates to uplifting the work that she's done and her status, you know, as a real pioneer for Black women in the design industry. Um, that's how it really, like, first started to come about. And since then, I've done an update to the presentation. I yeah. did it in 2020 at the AIGA Design Conference. Uh, if people want to check either of those talks out, they're both available on YouTube, absolutely free. Go check them out. It's funny you mentioned passing the torch because I don't give those talks anymore. Yeah, I'm like, they're on YouTube. Go <laughs> forth and listen. I don't want to have to kind of keep bringing it up in, yeah. in that way. But also, you know, with Cheryl doing the work that she's done and talking about kind of the next generation and like who she sees coming up, it's important to sort of pass that torch because I think what ends up happening with let me put it this way. It's a it's a byproduct of digital design and that a lot of the work that we do is fairly ephemeral. Mm. It will get overwritten, redesigned, yeah. et cetera. And unless we as practitioners are keeping our own archives, mm. probably no one else will. Right. Maybe the, the Internet Archive will have a record of it. But if you don't keep your own records, then how are you supposed to know kind of like what the the work is that you've done and that people can see it. Right. Um, Cheryl, to her credit, kept meticulous records throughout her career. I mean, to the point now where they're part of Stanford's research library, like she kept very meticulous records of the work that she had done, the people she talked to, contracts, proposals, all of that. Mm. People can go and see all of that sort of stuff. Um, and so when I think about kind of passing the torch, it's to me like, Continuing the conversation, I think, is important because certainly as design and technology have started to really sort of move forward, this conversation around diversity now becomes important to both communities. Of course, we've seen over the past 10 years a lot of talk around diversity in tech. Um, and diversity in design, I feel like, has always been sort of right behind that or right beside right. it in terms of importance. And so as those two fields become more merged, like design and tech become more merged, they end up sort of sharing and feeding into that sort of similar problem. Mm. So you think about passing the torch, um, it's sort of been done now with what Mitzi Oku is doing yeah. with Where Are the Black Designers. Uh, in 2020, she started a conference that sort of takes the question that I posed in 2015 and continues on that. Um, more so, I think, towards a like ally slash BIPOC sure. kind of lens. So it sort of takes that and, and maybe like, branches it out a bit but i think the question is still valid i mean one i know i still get companies that email me asking where are the black designers so it's still a question that yeah. uh kind of needs to be answered but when you think about passing the torch uh you should have a torch to pass mm. if that makes any sense right. i mean the reason that cheryl the reason i was able to really sort of feed off of what I did for my 2015 presentation was based off of Cheryl's work. I was able to read her 1985 thesis that she did for Pratt Institute that became the 1987 print article, which became the 1990 working journal for AIGA, which started the 1991 symposium mm. to even sort of get this conversation off the ground on a national level. Right. If none of that existed, or if I hadn't gone looking for it, or if I hadn't discovered Cheryl, I would be kind of starting from scratch. Right. And like that would be ahistorical, first of all. Yeah. Um, and it wouldn't tell the whole story. Right. Right. I, I, I think I think one of the things that that I love about this conversation too is uh everything that you put out in the world builds on it, right? Yeah. Um and and again, I think there's another piece to if you see that opportunity, uh, you know make it happen yourself. Right. Because it's going to benefit somebody. I think at least I think nowadays, you know, you mentioned putting in the presentation and, and being able to reference uh, that's very powerful w within itself. And that's a tool, you know, if we look back, wasn't there, you actually had to have a person that kept that. And so mm -hmm. whatever you do, and even like just kind of thinking about the, the guests that you've had on the show, so many people are pushing that conversation of design, what it means and evolving it. It's very important to to really give back and allow folks to have access to it, to really build more on that, that future that we all envision we're included in. Yeah. And I mean, now, you know, it's, it's so great that we're seeing more books 
yeah. by black designers or books that are featuring black designers. Yeah. We're seeing more podcasts and more conferences and events and things like that. You know, I mean, even what you and I are doing right now, yeah. 10 years ago, this would not, I wouldn't say five years ago, but certainly 10 years ago, this wouldn't be a thing. Yeah. You and I, two black designers talking at San Francisco Design Week on a stage like this. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, well, look, and I've said this, you know, at the beginning of the show, you've been a huge inspiration for me, uh, you know, especially being within the product design realm. I felt that there was a huge need to have more representation in building that platform. And so, you know, I think there is something to anyone going out there and, and providing more of that visibility that can inspire that next person uh, to really build on having, a, you know, a stronger voice and, and building more influence in that way. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe give us, uh, give the audience and the listeners, uh, uh, how, how, how might they get access to your podcast, you, like where, where is that available? Yeah, so I'm super easy to find. Just do a Google search for Maurice Cherry. You probably, I might be the first result, I don't know. But if not, you can go to mauricecherry.com. That's my website. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, just search for Maurice Cherry. Um, I'm on Twitter, at Maurice Cherry, all one word. Um, I have a Tumblr as well, which is kind of just like my yeah. random link blog that's at tumblr.com yeah. slash Maurice Cherry, I think. And then for Revision Path, I'm at revisionpath.com. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram under that. Just search for Revision Path, all one word. Awesome. And this is a great lesson on uh, personal branding, by the way. Uh, <laughs> find your stuff stick to it preferably your first and last name um yeah <laughs> so hey you know we've got some listeners on the on the on the broadcast right now uh we've got 10 more minutes left on the stream feel free to ask any questions that y'all have on on the top of mind and, and we'll try to answer them if not we'll we'll wrap up on the show so this is your chance uh you know to, to ask any questions there No questions in the chat yet, but um, people commenting on the great advice that we're getting from from this podcast so far. Awesome. As far as like keeping track of your work and everything. Awesome. Well, look, you no know, questions. You know, did I did I leave did I leave them speechless? No <laughs> questions. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. This was a very this was a very wide ranging interview. We talked about music. We talked about the biopic. So look, the biopics come. No, I'm joking. But sometimes you got to manifest <laughs> those things, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, look, if we don't have any questions, Maurice, I know you, you've you got some, some a couple weeks off before you move into uh, your new gig. I don't want to take away from any of the time that you have to chill out. Uh, again, <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. Uh, and for our listeners, uh, listeners and viewers, um, be sure to tune back in tomorrow. We have the UX Research Corner, um, a huge clubhouse group. I think they have more than 37,000 uh, listeners from around the world. And we've got researchers uh, from a number of different companies there. I think we're going to have anywhere between four and six guests on the show as guests tomorrow. So uh, that'll be the most folks that I've ever had on a single podcast. Uh, wow. And then on, on Thursday, we'll have Julia Fernandez, who's an SF Design Week student ambassador, talking about the Hire Me program, and her journey as an emerging designer, as well as Jacob Hernandez, a designer from LinkedIn, who's going to be talking about some of the equity work and the conversation about the power of transformation. We'll round out the week with Matt Barnes, who's a creative director at Amazon. And we're going to have a fun conversation around design, creative process, as it relates to artwork and one of his passions, which is brewing beer. Uh, so the last two days, we'll actually have some folks in the studio. It's going to be a good time. Be sure to tune in tomorrow at the same exact time, 1130 a.m. to 1230 p.m. I appreciate folks' patience moving off the boom set platform onto YouTube. We need to figure out these technical difficulties. Uh, so that's my rant and closing Thank you so much. And Maurice, thanks again, as always. Uh, have a good one. All right. Thanks for having me. 
My name is Harrison Wheeler, and this is Technically Speaking.